Well, hello, everyone. Um, time to do another podcast. I'm really, really excited about today. I have the Managing Director of Microsoft Australia and the Chair of Corporate Mental Health Alliance in Australia, Stephen Worrell. And uh, as you can see in the background, obviously, uh, an Australian and Wallabies fan, and we've had some banter in the past. But the thing I love about Stephen is um, he's been managing director for four years, but he's a real advocate for mental health. And Steve lives in Sydney with his wife and three children and and uh, passionate about anything to do with water, but also creating stronger communities in Sydney. And that's something that I am totally uh, aligned with. And I think, um, you know, with my work in Mentimia, when I came across Stephen and the first things he started talking about was the well-being of his people. So excited about today with such a prominent leader in, in business to understand mental health and what it looks like in the workplace. And so here we go. How are you, my friend? How are you? I'm, I'm very well, JK. It's a privilege to, uh, to, to chat with you. And I, I want to make it clear that the jersey's been up there all year. I didn't just put that up there for, for today's conversation. <laughs> and the Wallabies are doing good. They're, they're, they're playing a good style of footy. A few ups and downs, a bit like the All Blacks this year, but they seem to be on the improve. They're, they're definitely on the, on the right track, but as we were chatting earlier, a long way to go. And um, the All Blacks continue to be the benchmark that we measure ourselves against. So bring on 2021. So tell me, what was it like, Stephen, leading through COVID? And how did you personally respond to the challenge and then try and lead that with your team? Oh, look, I, I think like, like everyone, JK, it's been a, a year that uh, I'll, I'll never forget. Um, challenges that we've never faced before and I, and I hope, quite frankly, we never have to face again. Uh, I, th I think the, f the first level, the first response was a very personal one about... Um, exactly what this meant for you know my family uh, um, and, and, the, and the people closest to me if you go back to february and march it's you know we look back now and we've learned so much and things have come so far but if we go back to february and march it was very uncertain there was massive anxiety in the community um, and so you know remembering that that time you, you know you think about your kids you think about your family you know, my mum is in an aged care facility here in in Sydney, she, she suffers from dementia. So you think about the implications for, for her. Um, so that was sort of the first first level. And then very, very quickly thereafter, then of course, you know, you've, you've got a role to play and we, and we all have a role to play in, in whatever, uh, whatever, we, whatever we're doing in our community or at work or in, in our family and um, thinking about how best to respond as a leader. And, um, you know, each day was another, another learning opportunity, quite frankly, JK, because every single day has thrown up you know, new challenges and new things that you didn't predict the day before. What, are, what were some of the standout characteristics of, of COVID for you? I know you talked about personal anxiety, but then also you're leading a whole lot of people um, who will be suffering from their own. So how did you, you know, deal with your own and then try and, I guess, give some confidence and certainty within the business? Yeah, well, I think... In that, in that context, you know, one of the first and most important steps was just increasing communication because it, there was great comfort uh, for us as a business, you know, from, for me and my team and then for all of the leaders across the country. You know, we were getting together very, very regularly, daily, in fact, to, to talk about the latest health advice from the government, but, but also then to think about uh, how we best... Um, needed to respond to look after our teams so you sort of maybe look at a set of concentric circles uh, the well-being of our teams was was um, foremost in our thinking and so we were very deliberate about how we could best support our teams across the country um, very shortly after that you start thinking about and connected to so how do we play our role supporting our customers because uh, you know one of the uh, reflections from this year jk is and this will be true in New Zealand, I know it's true around the world, you know, just how uh, dependent we are all on each other. And as, as an obvious, as obvious a statement as that seems to, to be, we've been reminded this year of how, um, how much we rely on our, our health system and the wonderful people who work in our hospitals and around the country to, uh, you know, support the community or, or teachers in our, our education system who continue to do remote learning for our kids. Uh, all the many people in different government services 
supermarkets, right? Just the food, the food supply. There were concerns about whether we had enough food. So thinking about how we could, first of all, look after our teams, but then allow them to do the important work they needed to do to support those that were, were keeping, quite frankly, the community going. So, you know, I think you rapidly go from the, the, the shock of what is this and how do we deal with it to then, okay, now let's get together as a team, just like you would as a football team or any group on one day at a time. Again, as obvious as that sounds. Uh, and then, um, you know, you find your way forward. And so that's, that's been the, the um, sort of approach through the year. I think, I think for me, I, I talk about, um, I have a daily mental health plan. Um, it, it meant to me, we call it the six pillars. It's sort of move, chill, enjoy, connect, celebrate, and do. And I think that that connection piece, you know, from a business point of view, another business leader said to me once, we used to, you know, we used to measure um, sort of productivity and team values and all that stuff with our eyes because people were in front of us, yep. you know, and, and COVID has completely broken and thrown that and changed that. So how did, how do, how have you connected during this time when we're used to a different way to connect? Yeah, you know, a lot of it has been using this sort of technology. And I, and I think one of the positives that's come out of the year is that we've realized that this type of technology can uh, help us to connect and do things that we might have formerly thought had to be done face to face. Uh, and so I think, you know, that's one part of it. Basics around, you know, just picking up the phone and talking with each other. You know, we had other ideas where, you know, we were in lockdown, people were getting together in postcodes. If you knew that there were team members who lived in a particular postcode and that complied with the government guidance about how far you could stray from home, uh, you know, we, we were getting people together in that way. And so it, it's amazing in a way, again, not surprisingly, how many different ideas and approaches can come up when you really need them, when the chips are down. Uh, and, you know, the, the core, I think, JK, was just realising that we're all human. We're all trying to do the very best that we can. Um, yes, you know, as the leader of this business, I have a specific role to play. Everyone has a role to play. And uh, respecting that, acknowledging that, and then just connecting regularly to then think about what's the, the right next step for us to take has proven to be, uh, you know, a good approach for us. And I know that, you know, it's been similar in government and many, many businesses across here in, in Australia. I think for me, um, COVID brought reflection and, and also an awareness of my age, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, you know, and what happened was I used to be going to 21st and parties and now I'm going to 60th and funerals. Um, and the realization of that was pretty scary. And I, I know you mentioned, um, you know, your mum before having dementia. My, my mother-in-law has, you know, just showed some early signs of dementia. My wife had to go back to Italy and all that sort of stuff. But I know that you went through a pretty tough um, mental time, some challenges when your father got cancer. Um, and at the same time, your mum was unwell. And also you were you were in charge of Microsoft. You'd just been put into this huge role. I mean, how, how do you balance? How did you deal with that, the emotion? How do you keep level-headed at work? How do, you, how do you do, you know, when those things, when two or three things hit? Hmm. When I, well, first thing, JK, I think you know, my story is, is like so many, they're, they're all different. But uh, what I've come to learn over the last several years is that, you know, my experience is very, very similar to, to so many, whether it is related to aging parents or whether it's related to the 53 other sorts of things that can happen in any, anyone's life at work, uh, in a community, with your friends, with family. And so um, that, that uh, was, a, was an important realisation because um, earlier on through that, that period that you've just described, I'm not sure I dealt with it particularly well, quite frankly. Um, you know, my father um, struggled with cancer and um, there was a two-year period where he was in a decline dealing with the, um, the disease. And I remember a conversation early on in that, in that period where he said, uh, I've got two brothers, he said to us, uh, you know, oh, boys, I'd, I'd like to um, die at home. I'd like you to make sure you, you, know, you make the arrangements for me to do that. And, and we're all like, you, you bet, Dad, right on. Not having any clue, quite frankly, what that entailed. Um, quite, quite literally, no idea. Uh, and and I'm, I look back now and think, you know, 
uh, it might have been a good idea for me to, to um, know a little bit more about what that might involve because that set off a chain of events that created a range of pressures in our family because uh, at the same time as you've also um, uh, mentioned mum's dementia was progressing and so um, so look yeah I, and I just start, started at Microsoft and and you know trying to play my role as we talked about earlier the expectations that, that I had of myself what I what I should do how I should show up um, you know I, I laid so much pressure on myself and I look back now and think I had great support around me. My, you know, my boss at the time uh, couldn't have been more supportive. Um, this is the most normal and natural conversation to have because we're all parents, right? And in many cases, we've all had to deal with or will deal with these sorts of issues. Or we've got young children, or we've got a sick family member, or we've got other pressures. I'm a father to three kids. I'm, I'm working at Microsoft, I'm trying to be a good son and I wasn't getting it all done. And I thought, well, maybe I'm going to have to lighten the load here. I don't want to just acknowledge you because you've been such a wonderful advocate for this topic, right? Mental health and, and how, it impacts, uh, how it impacted you and your role model is, um, is wonderful. So I want to acknowledge that. Thank you, mate. So the, the thing that, that interests me about, especially CEOs and I think possibly sports people, we are perceived to be Superman. And I think a lot of that perception comes from within. So, you know, when you are trying to balance a personal thing going on in your home, you're trying to be a dad, a husband, a business person. I mean, what were your biggest learnings from that? What would you change straight away rather than getting to a point of breaking? Yeah. I think um, what I would change is that my initial reaction, and I'm not, I'm not proud of this, um, but, but it's, um, it's part of the learning world is I'm a leader at Microsoft. I'm, I'm, I have my own family uh, uh, and my parents need me right now and I'm going to do it all. Um, and, and then failed, right? Because I couldn't do it all and wasn't, wasn't able to um, uh, reach out for the help that I needed. The reaction um, in, in some cases with dad's requirements, because there would be random calls, 24 by 7 support in delivered in, care, in home, trying to organise all of that, took, took some doing, um, was that I, I, there was a very selfish reaction as to, you know, um, the workload that was being uh, thrust on me or why it was all happening at once. And um, that selfish reaction was, you know, this is unfit and, I, you know, I just need to get through this period and, and then um, find another another solution. And you know, I think the learning for me was um, it wasn't about me. It was about my parents and it was about a part of life. Um, like most things, um, they come and then they go, right? And the only thing you need to be focused on is the present moment. I think, you know, that learning came, came late for me, um, but I, I hope I can use that going forward because that's the only certain thing in life, right? That, that there's going to be another challenge around the corner and dealing it with a bit more equanimity and a little bit more um, balance, I think is um, it's going to be helpful for me, so I, I'm sure in future. What was, what was the realization? You said a little bit late. Do you think people in our position or in your position can actually um, learn pre or it's just a natural progression you need to get there as quick as you can but what was your realization I think it's I'm certain you can learn faster uh, <laughs> uh, and that's again why you know this conversation is important that's why your role modeling is so important because it just demystifies the topic pressures that I thought were upon me at work may not actually have existed if I just had a conversation with my boss uh, I might have been able to deal with other issues from my mum and dad if I'd have reached out and got more more help. Um, and so uh, I'm absolutely certain that you can learn these lessons and I think benefit from other people's experience. That's what the Alliance is all about, actually. It just says that we're all human. Uh, we're, we're, we're all dealing with a range of issues. Many of them are similar, but many of them are different. How, how, do, we, how do we best come together to support you? that could change how you look at the, situ the situation you're dealing with, or you might be having a conversation with someone that can change their life, right? Uh, and I think, and you talked about that in your experience, JK, 
it's just so powerful that if we talk more about these topics, just as you know, we talk about physical health, no one has an issue talking about physical health. It's obvious you eat well, you exercise, you look after yourself, then you, you live a better, more active existence, right? I mean, no one's going to debate that. Why can't we have the same level of, of uh, conversation about mental health? Because it's, it's the same thing. So what would you say to either your own self back then or, a, or an, another executive that is in a similar situation? What were the three big things you would be able to say to them right now? Yeah, it's advice that I've, I, I, I've sort of given myself over the years, but, but um, yeah, maybe experience to your earlier question. But first is... Um, to check your reaction to the situation you're in. And for me, it was a selfish response. You know, it's unfair, it's happening to me. And that's, you know, as I'm embarrassed to admit it now, um, that that realization that, that it wasn't about me, it was my mum and dad needing needing us, right? Needing me. Uh, and stop stop seeing it as a from a selfish point of view. I think that'd be the first the first realization and and it's an important one right because that that framed how i then reacted and responded i you know things were overwhelming there was too much going on i wasn't coping and it was never about me uh, so so putting putting me out of it i think would be the first one second realization uh is th there's no point worrying about what's happened in the past or worrying about what might happen in the future the only moment that really matters is the one we have right now you know you and i having this conversation right now being present, but being there and realizing that that's where life is, not not worrying about whether you've yeah you've handled something well and what happened yesterday or last week, or you know uh, what's going to happen tomorrow or next year. Um, just be in the moment and to the extent possible, realizing that this that this is a um, we're privileged, lucky to be. Here. So. That they'd probably be the two uh, pieces of advice that I'd give to my former or my earlier younger self, uh, and I still try to reflect on that today because it's a there's a constant renewal and, and process of reminding yourself. I think, J.K. Um, uh, and, and and hopefully that uh, helps to inform the work that we do as an alliance because um, everyone's response is unique, but I think some of these principles are. Um, are are common just again as you've shared very common your your story um, resonates with so many because there are common thoughts there i know that you've you're you know you're um you know very big into mental health you're you, you know you're chairman of the mental health alliance you know you're you're in the communities you really care about your community especially in indigenous community so all these things that you've learned what is the future for you around the position of mental health in the workplace? How, obviously you're keen to open up the conversation, but for, for CEOs around the world, why should they bother? Why? Because it's not an easy place to go, right, Stephen? It's a hard place, the hard conversations. It's a different way to do business. So why would someone say, well, I'm going to really care for my people. Why can't we just carry on? Oh, look, I think... It's not as I've not found it as hard as 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 you've described because I think every CEO that I've talked to, or many of them have joined us, and many many are very interested in what we're doing, and all of them are doing their own things in their own way inside their organisation. Um, but but I think to your question, there's there's um, some basic uh, reasons why, um, starting at the sort of base level and working up. It's just it's good for business. Right now, we have a productivity commission here in Australia. I, I don't know what the equivalent is in New Zealand, but, but there will be an equivalent. Uh, we estimate the cost of poor mental health in Australia is $51 billion per year. And then when you connect with other costs, it's about $180 billion. It's a, it's a massive, massive impost on, uh, on, on us as a community. And, and you think, okay, if we could address that or if we could reduce the impact of mental health, economically, there's a massive impact which can help so many people. So that'd be the first one. Uh, quite obviously, there's a legal uh, responsibility as well to provide a psychologically safe workplaces. And there've been companies uh, taken to court uh, and found guilty of creating unsafe workplaces. 
and and the one that I think drives uh, clearly drives you, JK, and it drives many of us is the moral responsibility that we have. We, we work in these workplaces. We want to enjoy, uh, you know, to be able to enjoy them. Um, so I think there's multiple reasons, um, and there's 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 nothing here other than upside. How did you lead? How do you lead that within your business? So you're passionate about it you're talking about it, you're trying to implement it, but how do you actually lead it on a daily basis? What would be your biggest change once you said, right, um, I know it's in me, I care about it, but now I must change myself in the workplace. Is there anything that jumps out about how you changed your everyday work life? I, 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 I'm not sure it's, I, I'd, I'd say it's a, I've changed because I'm a work in progress. Um, what I would reflect on that question, JK, is early on in the pandemic, um, we, as we got together, these data calls, it became very obvious very quickly there was a range of reactions. As many people as we had on these calls, there was another story. And we at Microsoft, like many businesses, talk about this idea of empathy, right? Empathy for our clients, our partners, our community, but of course, for each other. And empathy is a really easy thing to talk about, and it's a hard thing to do uh, consistently, uh, authentically. And so, what I've what I've tried to uh, continually remind myself throughout the year is that you can't totalize the experience that everyone's having this year through COVID. Just as you can't totalize everyone's mental health in relation to how they react to the environment that 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 I helped to create here in Australia. Um, you know, I might say I, I want to. I'm a business leader who wants to create a high performance environment so that we can we can deliver the best results for our customers and partners. Who wouldn't say that? Some people may react to that and think, well, that's an environment where I'm pushed to go too far, where I feel like I'm under pressure all the time, and I I feel like the company's expectations are too much. And so, um, as I say, it's not a change, JK, but it's a, a continual reminder of connecting with each person. Maybe this is back to the idea of being present in the moment because it's um, one, one of the many mistakes I've made over the years and, and still make uh, uh, from time to time is not being present in, in those important conversations all the time. And every conversation is important, right? Um, being present enough so that you can really connect with the person, the group, the team, the, you know, the segment, of the business that you're talking to and then hopefully together we can make uh, the decisions that are going to help all of us be at our best because that's simply put what i'm after I, I want i want to be at my best and i'd like to create an environment where everyone can be at their best the corporate mental health alliance which is a global movement for better workplace mental health in the uk you're very heavily involved what why do you think it's so important for us to get together as businesses and talk about this as actually alliance i know you've been uh, fundamental in, in talking to your peers across australia so what motivates you to to try and make this change well i mean i first of all i know i can learn from from others and so you know the the alliance members i think we all acknowledge that reality that each of us are doing a range of, of things and some work, some don't. Well, actually, we, we try this and this seemed to work. Oh, right. Okay, maybe I can use that. And I remember a moment, JK, uh, I think we, we said, let's, let's pull together. And like within 36 hours, you know, 14 um, of the board came together. You can imagine how difficult it is to get people to quickly find time. Uh, but we did. And we had a conversation, it was an hour, about this is how we're reacting, this is what we're seeing. And each person around the table just shared a couple of anecdotes. It was, it was um, amazing, right? I mean, it was good for, for us, maybe a bit of therapy, because we could then as leaders also decompress a little about the challenges that we were facing. But we all walked away with two or three new ideas that we could go and implement. So fundamentally, JK, it's about recognising that we can learn and improve, and, and we can do that together. So that would be the first thing. The second then is um, is more ambitious, which is um, none of us profess to be experts in the mental health landscape. Um, and that's why we've asked a group of people who are expert to advise us. And so we, 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 we describe ourselves as being expert guided, but business led. And we've got people from academia, people from government, um, 
uh, people who uh, have worked in, in and around the mental health landscape all of their professional lives, helping to then direct our activities so that we can then say, okay, great, this is, this is the bar we've established today. Uh, these are the incremental improvements we're making, but this is how we can make a step change. This, this is how we'll redefine what a psychologically safe workplace looks like in future. And uh, together, uh, we're gonna run some experiments, test some hypotheses, do some research, use our collective resources to then plot that path. So the, this is a really interesting question. You can imagine that the All Blacks are playing Australia tomorrow and I go and sit down with David Campisi and talk to him about how we're going to go the next day or, or Richie McCaw goes and talks to David Pocock. I mean, you're even talking with your competitors. I mean, how, how do you actually put this subject ahead of all that and you're talking to people that normally you'd just be competitive. I mean, imagine me, Campo, what do you reckon, mate? I'm gonna have a go on the outside. So how do you how do you explain that away? I'm, I'm, I'm certain Campo would throw you a dummy, JK, and he'd uh, send you down the wrong path. But uh, look, um, that's been one of the wonderful um, realizations that we've had. We've, we've got direct competitors uh, in the alliance. Coles and Woolworths, uh, pr probably the best example, our two major retailers in the country. Uh, as they said, uh, when we got together, there is nothing, absolutely nothing that they talk to each other about other than this topic. And what, why, why is that? Um, the, 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 in Australia, uh, the single largest killer of, of Australians between 15 and 44 is suicide. Uh, in our largest employers, those statistics play out pretty directly. So that uh, in some cases, uh, one, one or two team members um, pass away through suicide every month. And it's beyond, I don't have the words to describe how terrible a statistic that is. Um, and you can imagine uh, how deeply felt that issue is inside those those companies as it is of course across our community but it's when it, when it gets brought home so directly jk where it's your team right it could be your teammate right in in in, in you know who's been working with you but it's when it's your team and and that's the reality you know enough is enough right um we as a community have to do more do better to look after uh, our, our, uh, our teams and, and the people around us. And I think the business leaders, again, Coles and Woolworths and others in the Alliance, we, we just think uh, more needs to be done. Um, and we, um, the corporate sector, have to be part of the solution because, again, people spend so much time at work and a lot of the mental anguish and stress that gets created uh, can be traced back to the workplace. So Microsoft, I mean, I've, I've um, you know, read so much about your organization. It's absolutely visionary, you know, Bill Gates, the story I've watched documentaries, read stuff on him. Um, so tell me about Microsoft and, and the reason why you love working there and some of its values, because when, when something gets so big, how do you control it? It must be a juggernaut. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't know that we um, we ever aspire to uh, con con control uh, every aspect of what we do so much as uh, recognise the the privilege that we have uh, and the responsibility we have as as a large large business that has has and is playing such an important role in our community uh, you know, here and around the world. Yes, we're a commercial entity, and let's not 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 uh, confuse ourselves on that topic. But I think. Um, I think companies have, have a role to play beyond just the service of the core stakeholders and certainly beyond the typical motives of business in terms of making a, making a profit and, uh, and, and, the, and, the, and the basics associated with uh, operating an ongoing enterprise. Uh, and I give Satya Nadella, our CEO, all of the credit here because I think over the last six years, seven years during his reign as CEO, um, he, he's reconnected the company, I think, with what, what really does matter. Uh, we're not perfect by any means, but I think there was a realization that there was a period, a long period, uh, over the last 20 years where we lost sight of what, what we were about, um, why we existed. But I think um, there's a very clear understanding of what we aspire to achieve, and it is um, very much about how we can have a positive impact on our, our community, how we can use technology to level the playing field. 
uh, how, how we can um, build more equity into communities around the world and not just in privileged countries like Australia and New Zealand. How can we use technology to uh, address the many, many underserved billions on the planet who don't have access to the services that we enjoy, who don't have the health system, the education system, or all of the uh, wonderful um, service we enjoy living in these, this, this great part of the world. So, um, and, you know, and, and as altruistic as that sounds, I think there is a responsibility that goes along with being a leader, right? I, I think you've got to, got to do more than just uh, look after yourself. I think that's fundamental and hopefully uh, that's, that's the role that we can continue to play. A really wise man, Stephen, once said to me that love is a verb. It's a doing word. So, there you go. Um, yeah, and I and it's some of the best advice I've got. And often, you know, when we talk about this stuff and you talk about mental health and you talk about the values, you know, sometimes you walk into businesses and you see the values written on the wall, on the wall but there's nothing under, underneath them. So as a, as a business leader, what are the few things that you would do to understand the impact or the success that some of these values and some of these things that you want to put into the business? How do you actually measure them so that you know you're on the right track? Yeah, I, I'm happy to offer um, some thoughts there. I, I for, for sure would, would say that we're, we're still uh, working that out. Uh, but, but the first thing that comes to mind, JK, is, JK, is how, how, do, how do you help your team, your individuals in your business connect with the, the company at a personal level. And what, what I mean by that is um, every business serves a, a purpose, right? It serves a community, it serves a particular constituency and set of customers. But, but beyond that, right, what, what is the, the social role that that business plays? How does, it, how does it actually positively contribute to the community? Because once you start to think about that, then Pretty quickly, you find members of your team uh, will already have those interests uh, in mind. They, they come from that community. So one, one way that we uh, have definitely been able to measure impact is the amount of time and energy and effort our team members put into pursuing those personal interests and then leveraging Microsoft in the process. You know, we, we, we talk about connecting your personal passion with the platform that is Microsoft. Now, now, I know this won't translate directly in every case, and, and I also acknowledge we, we, you know, a big tech firm uh, at this moment, we're in an in a incredibly privileged position. I, I get that. But I do think if you can help um, any member of the team, and I guess this starts with the leadership, to look at the bigger picture, acknowledge that this, this is a business that has a social role, that it isn't just about profit, it isn't just about our shareholders, it is about um, the, the responsibility we have to our community to, to conduct business in an ethical way. I think that's been the primary way in which we've started to measure and sense that it's a virtuous circle of better business results at the same time, stronger contribution and engagement in, in your community. And it's amazing to think, right? We're a multinational, 140 countries around the world, but you can replicate that, right? It's different. So what I do here is different to what um, Vanessa is doing in New Zealand or to any of our leaders might be doing around the, around the world, but you, you localize it and then you start to, to deepen local ties. And I think that is acknowledged and recognized and appreciated by your, your stakeholders, so long as it's done in an authentic and consistent way, because th this isn't, it's, you know, it's my strategy this year or isn't something we're gonna start and see how it goes this has to be deeply held and has to be has to come from the top as a result there's been um a lot of talk about about you know COVID and and things that need to change or have changed or forced them to change what are some of the things that uh, you've implemented this year that you've either you know failed fast or you're really proud of because you took a little bit of a risk and and it and it came off we, um, yeah, there's lots of those examples. I, I, I think we talked about the communication. Um, you know, we, we in Microsoft have a, a lot of conversation about stopping uh, the creation of internal meetings because we want to make sure we've got, we maximize our time with our customers and partners. And so there was a sense of re reluctance to then implement more internal discussions. 
but I think um, we, we realized pretty early on that this was a moment where we needed to be together uh, more often. So more frequent, shorter meetings, um, and obviously using this type of technology where we could connect with people all across the country. Um, we, we typically we get our teams together because it's so important as social beings that we engage in a, in a physical way. Um, but we, we um, changed our kickoff meeting to be, it was almost like a TV show. Uh, and interestingly, JK, what we found, we were really surprised. Um, while there was a lot of people saying, I, I miss the idea of you know, coming to a physical location and seeing everyone, people felt that this delivery in, in some cases was more personal. So, you know, I might have 800 people in a hall at the ICC in Sydney. This year it was, uh, you know, myself, my leadership team and a variety of others engaging in this format. And we had people reporting overwhelmingly that they felt that was more personal. They felt more engaged. They felt that uh, there was a deeper understanding of what we were trying to do together. Uh, so I think, you know, that, that was counterintuitive, right? We didn't, we didn't expect that. And yet that's been, been our experience. Um, and then the, the last thing is uh, we, we've seen such a wave of collectivism uh, here in Australia, and I, and I know the same is true in New Zealand, where government and business and everyone has pulled together. Because you know we started 12 months ago with bushfires and floods and, and now the pandemic, it's been a hell of a year. Uh, so I, I think challenging our assumptions about, you know, with government, for example, you know, government won't react fast enough to this. So we've got this great idea, but but I'm sure they're not they're not uh, ready. Or uh, you know we tried that last time and it fell apart because we couldn't get the right sponsorship. Uh, or we were asked to help and we tried to, but we weren't able to engage. I think what I've learned and and continue to remind my team is that uh, I've seen government move so fast uh, in the last 12 months in ways I've never seen in my life, to be honest. Uh, and government, broadly speaking, there have been some missteps for sure, but they've done such a wonderful job, uh, you know, in, in, in Australia, protecting us and running our health system and providing medical advice. And then our, ed our education system has done such an incredible job to adapt. Not perfect, but I think there's a real uh, challenge there for us to rethink how we look at our relationship with government and we think about the business community. And again, why the Alliance is such a good thing, I, I hope, is that it's proving that competitors can come together. We, we can come together and, and work on things that are important for our community. Um, as, as long as we're prepared to, you know, maybe take a risk and step outside the usual swim lane that we might otherwise find ourselves in. I just want to talk to you, change it up a bit, go a little bit personal on you. Um, you know, we spoke before about um, a daily mental health plan. We call it the six pillars and often i talk to and i think it was in a, a an executive in a similar situation to you he said the most important thing jk is to manage your imbalance because he said often when we're in positions of power we are spending 10 or 12 hours at work but um so i just want to ask you um the six pillars so what do you do to move what how, how do you look after yourself from a move point of view I, I have a um, pretty set routine. I go to the gym a couple of days a week. I paddle, so, so I do a bit of paddling. I run, uh, and then I, I take out to uh, Golden Retrievers for a, uh, a dash around the neighbourhood. So every day there's, there's something. Chill? How do you chill out? Um, actually, it intersects with the first. I, anytime I'm on the water, on it, on it or in it, uh, my, my mind, my... my uh, <laughs> my being goes to a happy place. So, uh, so getting, getting onto the water is, is generally a, a good thing. Or listening to music is another way that really helps, helps me. What do you listen to? Well, that's, that's an eclectic mix right there, JK, but a um, bit of Bob Marley. Uh, on old wow. school. So I love, I love a bit of reggae. Jack Johnson, that's my oh, talking yes. to you. But of course, you know, great Aussie bands, Powderfinger, um, well crowded house. So maybe it's a bit of New Zealand flavor there as well. So, uh, <laughs> nice what about uh what about enjoy what uh, what do you enjoy i enjoy my kids and my and my wife enormously we've just come at a couple of days uh holiday and I, it's one of those times when you don't realize how much you need a break until you have it but i i i, I get such enjoyment from just being with 
with them. And um, we, we played, we went to a place at Port Stephens, uh, played cards, uh, did a bit of sailing, uh, wandered around, um, just loved spending time with them, which I should say through this year, I've been able to do more of. And that's one of the things I'm gonna hold on tightly um, as we recover from, from the crisis. How do you connect? Yeah, it, 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 in a professional context, as I said earlier, because I connect with so many, it, it's, it's this um, continual reminder of, of what it really means to be empathetic. And, and so that means being present, listening clearly, uh, and engaging at a personal level about the issues that are most impacting that person. And as, as simple as that sounds, uh, the, the, the way to really connect with people is just to demonstrate that you are with them physically, mentally, when you're talking with them, uh, and then actively thinking about uh, their experience. And so, um, I, you know, I think you, and as a result then, JK, you connect with people in so many different ways. You, you, know, you know, if you think about your mates or your family or, or, or your colleagues at work, it's all very, very different. But it starts with presence, and I think it starts with a genuine interest in their well-being. And on a personal level, because I often say that us males, we're shit. You know, like we're lucky though. We're lucky because we can, you know, I, I, I saw a mate of I hadn't seen for like four years the other day. It was like we'd spoken to each other yesterday, but we are not great at it. So how do you connect personally, keep in touch with your mates and that sort of stuff? Yeah, very, very um, deliberately again, because, um, you know, you think, you know, you go back to a mental health strategy. Part of it, big part of it, of course, is your family and your friends, right? And so I'm very deliberate about, uh connecting with them we we often get together to, we we have a bunch of mates that like sailing so we will do a lot of that together uh but um it could be any activity as blokes we generally tend, tend to go and do something as opposed to sit around and stare at each other um but uh yeah look i i, I think it's so important to connect with the people that you care the most about um maybe maybe we've been reminded of that if we needed to be this year but uh it's so essential i think to to mental health and just your general outlook on, on the world and everything in it. How do you celebrate? Usually with a couple of drinks too many, JK. I'm, you know, I'm, 50, I'm 50, 52 and I have to tell you that you think you've learned by this stage that um, alcohol in moderation is part of a balanced approach, but mm, that moderation thing often escapes me. So, um, but no, I, I, so, so I'd love, love to have a drink with, um, uh, with a bunch of mates and, and, and my family. Uh, but, you know, I also I learned something some some time ago about you know celebration takes so many forms and I mm. I celebrate uh, every time I'm uh, you know I mentioned earlier about being on the water that's just the moment and a place where I feel at peace and everyone has that right it could be it could be reading a book it could be just sitting quietly it could be meditating it could be walking I mean whatever it is for it, for you but understand what it is and then and then go there regularly I think it's uh, it's great advice. Yeah, like I, I often tell people that my problem's not drinking, my problem's stopping. <laughs> I think it, I think it's a, and I'm really serious. It's something that I'm not very happy or proud of myself with because I do tend to drink too much because I'm loving the moment and celebrating. Yeah. I think you're dead right. It's really, really important to find other ways to celebrate and to celebrate, you know, properly. And the last thing is, is what I call do because I always need to be, um, growing and learning so if you could do something that was away from work or do something just for you what would that be mm. I think I'm, I'm doing much of it now JK and that's that's part of um, part of my deliberate plan as well right to, to work out the things that will make you happy and to do more of them uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, but I I uh, I've reached a point where I uh, feel obliged, but I, but I feel encouraged and I feel motivated to, to do things that uh, have consequence far, far beyond my role and the responsibilities that I have today. And, and specifically in terms of the, the, the country, uh, I'd love to find ways to play a bigger role in, in helping Australia and to do things that matter for my community and the country in future, because, you know, I've, I've had every privilege that any person could ever have, JK, in my life, um, living in Australia, coming through this period, uh, and then 2020 has sort of slapped us all around the around the head to wake us up. And so 
uh, there's so much that needs to be done and I, I hope I can play some role in the future. What are you reading or what would you recommend I read? Uh, in fact, I've just finished reading for the second time a book called um, Buddha's Brain by Dr. Rick Henson. And so uh, for anyone who has any interest in understanding both both the, uh, the, the neurology, the science of how our, our mind and our brain works, but then also uh, entwined in more, the more spiritual side and obviously using some of the uh, timeless lessons from, from Buddhism. This is an awesome book, uh, so I love that. Another book uh, by David Roth called Your Mind at Work, which I read some time ago that really helped me to uh, slow down and just understand why I was reacting the way I was reacting in certain situations and then help me to be more present and to then uh, be uh, more in control of what was going to happen next. And so they're, they're two awesome books that have really helped me. Who would you like me to interview next? Uh, let me answer that in a second. What book would you recommend I read, JK? Um, Quiet. Quiet. Yeah, it's about introversion and extroversion. I think that um, I was a natural int introvert who got taught to be an extrovert, uh -huh. but I didn't realize um, some of the consequences that it's got on your um, energy levels. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I... I really enjoyed it because I could see myself in the book and it and it taught me to change my life a wee bit so I love being an extrovert yeah. but I've got to recover that energy so and an extroversion was actually a, like a marketing idea back in the 1930s they started promoting that if you won't be successful unless you're um you know unless you're extroverted so I I would I'd, yeah, I'd read quiet. Um, I'm also like you. I've been reading a little bit about um, our Indigenous past. I know yep. you're very passionate about our Indigenous um, people and how we can get them into roles of leadership and how we can even things up a wee bit. So I, I read a book about um, Te Whitio Rongomai. Who, so Te Whitio Rongomai is very, very famous. Um, well, actually, he's not that famous. Um, because we don't get taught our proper history here in New Zealand, probably. But Te Whitio Rongomai um, was the first person to do passive resistance. So Mahatma Gandhi studied him. So he was the first person ever in the world to do passive resistance in a place called Parihaka, which mm -hmm. is in the Taranaki. And I was actually um, inspired, but also ashamed that I didn't know enough about my own history. And um, I, I've done a podcast with Chantal Thompson, uh, who, uh, who, who I know you know. And, you know, she really challenged me. It was really interesting because I am ignorant to the history of our past. And I think if you want to um, change the way things are and even things up with our Indigenous people, first, you've got to get rid of the ignorance by learning. So I was both inspired and ashamed at the same time. So I would challenge anyone living in countries like ours to really pick up some book about, you know, pick up the books about our real history and what happened and some of the injustices and that sort of stuff. It was really interesting for me. Isn't that the truth? Yeah, it's, it's a big one. Stephen, thank you, my friend. Firstly, I'd just like to thank you as um, personally for the amazing work that you are doing um, by putting mental health and well-being first, the work that you do over and above your CEO role. Um, I'm like you, I believe it's the future of productivity and the future of the world. I know every time those stats come out, it hurts. And I think that business is actually the way forward to getting into some of these stats. So um, I was really excited about today. I am in awe of the passion that you have and, and the courage that you've shown to step up, step out, step into it so um thank you i know um time is precious and you've just given me an hour but i just thank you for the inspiration and the learnings it's been awesome uh pleasure's all mine jk thank you so much for the, the opportunity to engage today and um, i look forward to seeing you again very soon yeah and i'll put that all black jersey in the mail yeah well take it easy there's, so, there's only so far i'm prepared to go jk because i i believe we're going to get there i believe <laughs> thanks mate awesome yeah.